Hey there, it's Christy, and it's time for Face Paul Moments of the Week Friday Edition. Breaking the law, breaking the law. Here's a wrap up of some of the high points of last week's news in terms of Christian privilege trying to force their religion down other people's throats on public property. Christian flag flying above US flag outside Great Bridge office draws criticism. This story isn't about actually um, Christians who are being challenged by the by an atheist or secular group. Instead, it's just a really weird person giving their really weird views, demonstrating why we need the separation of church and state. The Christian flag flies outside of the Alliance Legal Group in Great Bridge, featuring a white background with a red Latin cross inside a blue square. But it's not what is on the flag that stirred controversy in Chesapeake, it's the, the location. It flies one foot above the United States flag. One of the attorneys at the firm, Steve, Steve C. Taylor, said, it should be God before government. There is something really important that Christians seem to miss when looking at the Bible, which is when the, if you believe the Bible was revealed to the Jewish people, it was only revealed to the Jews. It wasn't supposed to apply to the Sumerians or the Egyptians or the Canaanites. That was their God, their rules. And yet Christians think that because they worship a god, everybody should do it. And that is bullshit. And it's called Christian privilege. And when you do these kinds of things, then you're demonstrating that you're not really a patriot, you're a theocrat. And to me, I find that pretty scary. Really good news! One of the first stories that I covered on this show was about a Jesus sign welcoming people to a small town uh, on public property and that their Freedom From Religion Foundation was challenging it because it was unconstitutional. And so for the first time I can kind of wrap up a story that I've started here on Face Palm Moment and continued. Jesus barred from welcoming visitors to Texas town. Yay! The Hawkins City Council decided to remove a sign reading Jesus welcomes you following threats of a lawsuit from the nation's largest atheist organization. They voted earlier this week to remove the sign after a survey of the land where the signs located showed that it was on public property. They said that it was a tough decision but it had to be done to avoid a lawsuit against the city. Yes, you can't break the law. You would think that local officials whose job it is to sort of create ordinances and make sure that they're being observed by the citizens, would apply those to themselves. Wouldn't that be nice? School says Pledge of Allegiance is optional after accusations from atheist group. A Delaware high school was under fire for threatening to punish students who refused to stand during the Pledge of Allegiance. And the atheist group American Humanist Association said the high school senior reached out to them after their his teacher threatened him with punishment for sitting out the Pledge of Allegiance. The AHA sent a letter to the Newcastle County Vocational Technical School citing a 1943 Supreme Court ruling which gives students the right to sit out the pledge. There is something about freedom of speech that is silence that it is a form of speech to not engage in a pledge or other forms of you know, required speech. And again, this is sort of a narrow-minded litmus test that if you don't say the pledge and you don't believe in God, somehow you're not a real American. And how I define my patriotism is mostly, I mean, I take pride in the things that our nation has done right, but I acknowledge the things that our nation has done wrong. And those embarrass me, and I want to see improvement on them. And forcing people to say the pledge seems about as anti-democratic or anti-American in terms of free speech rights, I should say, that I can think of. Texas teacher under fire for large Christian symbol that an atheist parent reportedly noticed on a classroom shelf. Again, the blaze. I love taking these stories that are meant to go, oh no, atheists are making us follow the law and go, yeah, hey, look, atheists are making Christians follow the law. A public teacher in Texas is under fire after an atheist group wrote a letter complaining that she was displaying a large Christian cross in her third grade classroom and making comments to students about God's perfection. The American Humanist Association's Apignani Humanist Legal Center said the teacher, quote, has been displaying a large Christian cross in her classroom and proselytizing to her students through her classroom activities. The teacher reportedly told her class recently that only one person is perfect, and that person is our Lord. 
The comet was made as a Christian cross, approximately one foot in height, sat on a shelf in her room. Freedom of religious expression in the United States means that you have the right to practice your religion. It doesn't mean the right you have the right to proselytize your religion, especially on children who are not your own and in a public school that's paid for by taxpayer dollars. This doesn't seem that complicated. Why do we have, have this fight all the time? Na 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 dick moves. This isn't so much a direct dick move aimed at one person, but it's instead a critique of a dickish value that is being imposed upon women in certain communities. Here's how the pro-life money machine turns desperate women into submissive baby makers. Written by Vicki Garrison, whom you might know from uh, her critiques of the Quiverful movement. I'll read a quick excerpt, and then you can always click on the link in the D-box below for more information. They had already gotten inside my head, while thoughts of burning in hell for eternity silenced my brain, and images of dismembered tiny babies constrained my fight-or-flight instincts, I chose life. Pro-life rhetoric fertilizes a soil in which breeders for Jesus are cultivated. Hey, are you starting to recognize a pattern here? What I'm critiquing here is a marketing scheme which makes a huge, life-changing impact on desperate, vulnerable young women. Hey, remember how the Pope came to the U.S. and said people should have a human right to deny access to contraception because your employer happens to be a Catholic and that your Catholic employer should make these kinds of moral decisions for your life and that the government should support the Catholic Church in allowing it to do that? When the Catholic Church has a majority in Ireland, then they want to make divorce illegal and prevent gay marriage equality. And when they're in you know majority in the U.S., they want to use the power of the state offices to turn people down in terms of their legal rights. But when they're the minority, what happens? Christians welcome Nepal's secular constitution. Christian efforts to ensure that Nepal's new constitution would confirm the state's secular nature have been successful after the country's constituent assembly rejected proposals to introduce an article identifying Nepal as a Hindu religious country. Catholic leaders have welcomed the move, believing that the constitution's secular character is necessary if religious freedoms is to be maintained in the 81% Hindu country. Notice that when they're the minority, secular government is necessary for protecting religious freedoms. When they're the majority, oh, we get Christian privilege. So, you know, if your work happened to be a Jewish person, woman, or an atheist woman working for a Catholic extension, you know, like Notre Dame University or something, oh, you can't have contraception because of our religious beliefs. We don't care what you think. We don't care that you're trading your labor in exchange for health care and, and your salary, that you're earning that from your own labor. No, no, no. We don't want women to do certain things and you're a woman that we can control, so let's control you. That's how they operate when they're the majority. And when they're the minority, they want to hide behind the skirts of religious freedom. Fuck these guys. Now we're on to the dickest move. The biggest dickest award for this week goes to the Islamist group who published an international hit list of secular bloggers, including people from the United States, Britain, and Europe, that they encourage people to find and kill. A Bangladeshi Islamist group has published an international hit list of secular bloggers. The list is understood to contain the names of at least 20 people based all over the world, and Thomas Hughes, the executive director of Article 19, a group that defends bloggers' rights worldwide, told CNN, quote, This international threat to writers and bloggers is an unacceptable attack on freedom of expression. Such threats often have a chilling effect on expression, encouraging individuals and organizations to self-center for fear of violent reprisals, he added. In my opinion, one of the biggest fights that we are going to be having in the course of the 21st century is blasphemy laws versus freedom of expression, because that's really where I see the nexus of these two debates taking place. It's not so much, I think, like a Western versus Islam dynamic. I think it's those people who value freedom of expression and people who want to make it illegal to express ideas that threaten their fantasy worldview of the non-reality that they believe in. Highlighting the fact that speaking out against ideas could get people killed is something that um, I want to maintain in the news in this you know section so that we can keep track of these violent threats and work increasingly toward a global discourse that does not seek to protect 
an ideology, a supernatural ideology, by criminalizing critique and evaluation of its claims. You shouldn't win an argument by silencing your critics. That's not freedom, that's totalitarianism. Did you know about this? Here are some things you should know about. Speed round! There is so much news to get through for the did you know about this that I can't really take time out and make a comment about every single one. So I'm going to do them like really super fast and anything that catches your eye you can go below in the D-box and check it out. But first I need more tea. <gasps> the tea! Why is the tea always gone? What feminist Christians think about Pope Francis? From the article, as Christian feminist theologians, we've devoted our lives to promoting the full inclusion of women in Christian churches. No one knows better than we do the horrible history of Christian churches as it relates to women both in the church and throughout the world. And in the midst of this history, there is no one who symbolizes the power of church patriarchy more clearly than the patriarch of the church, the Pope. Given this, it might seem strange that as feminists, we are still excited about Pope Francis's visit to our community, New York, this week. Here's our feminist theological scorecard on the Pope. Except for the first story, I have a few comments that I want to add on the first story. I reject the idea that you can be a Christian feminist. I think you can be a Christian, and you can be a feminist, but you can't be a Christian feminist because there is no textual basis for f equality in the Bible. So if you're a Christian who believes in Jesus and all of the texts that he believed in, then you have to accept that Jesus thought women were less than men. They just were. He didn't make women apostles. He might have allowed them in his presence. Didn't mean he treated them as equals. There is no textual basis for men and women's equality in this life, in those texts. If you, the closest you get is Paul saying that men and women are one in Christ Jesus. But that's not in this world. That's like in the other world. That's after death and, and heaven and spiritually. The, just because they think that there might be some kind of spiritual equality in terms of worth in the Christian framework does not mean that they believe in men and women's social, political, economic, and religious equality. So in my opinion, you can't be a Christian feminist. Okay, now the speed round. Leaving Islam, how I became an atheist. This article recounts the personal journey of someone going from Islam into agnostic atheism. Atheistophobia. It's time to talk about the most persecuted minority in the world. This piece in The Nation is looking at the persecution of atheists, not only in Islamic nations, but the global trend to look at how atheists are the most persecuted minority on earth. Very good piece. I would highly recommend you take a few minutes to check it out. The ex-Muslim Britons who are persecuted for being atheists. This story covers a BBC investigation that found evidence that young people suffer from intimidation, threats, and, the, and being ostracized by their communities when they choose to leave Islam. The article mentions there are no official statistics on apostasy in British Islam and only a few academic studies have been done on this issue, all of which I think characterizes our lack of understanding of non-believers and people who are transitioning out of faith into rationalism. So this, I wanted to bring attention to this because one, it's a persecution issue that we should be aware of so that we can communicate it to others and also work on redressing. Secular thinkers under attack in India as religious fundamentalism grows. I'll quote from the piece here from Narida Nayak, president of the Federation of Indian Rationalist Association. Quote, fundamentalism in India is growing by the day across religions, Nayak said. They feel they can scare us into submission, but are completely mistaken. As far as I'm concerned, I would rather die speaking my mind instead of letting disgraceful things unfold in front of my eyes. Here's something that I found incredibly stunning. Catholic Church collects 1.6 billion in U.S. contracts, grants, since 2012. The church and related Catholic charities and schools have collected more than 1.6 billion since 2012 in U.S. contracts and grants in a far-reaching relationship that spans from school lunches for grammar school students to contracts across the globe to care for the poor and needy at the expense of Uncle Sam. I think this is important to flag up that this is definitely part of the Republican agenda, which is to get taxpayer money 
any way it can into the coffers of Christian institutions so that they can use that money to advance their theological agenda. Now, of course, that people are meant to have secular alternatives, but when there aren't secular alternatives, where do they go? Or people who aren't out atheists or don't really think about the fact, of, you know, aren't self-aware in terms of their God beliefs could be using, could be roped into this stuff. And so it's, and it also makes the church look good when it's taxpayers who are providing the service. How a Pentecostal preacher became a Bible Belt atheist. This documentary, uh, which is really short, it's about seven minutes in length, is about a former Pentecostal preacher and he started a secular congregation in the heart of the Bible Belt. If you are interested in deconversion stories, then go ahead and check this one out. <clears throat> That's going to wrap up our episode for this week. Come back on Tuesday for another episode of Face Palm Moments. I hope you enjoyed learning about all of these stories. And until next time, I've been Christy. You've been awesome. Thanks for watching all the way to the end of the video, and we'll see you soon. Bye.